Hello, Sargon. My name is Raidwald. I recently watched your video on ideological lenses, and I'd like to talk to you about it. While I believe you had many great insights about avoiding unhealthy models of reality, I also think you, under you misunderstood the nature of models of reality and, and of uh, ideological lenses. You see, in anatomy, the lens is the part of the eye which allows you to focus. It focuses the light that enters your eye in order for you to make sense of what you are seeing. In fact, what you are seeing right now is a photograph taken without a lens. I don't know what the world would look like without lenses in your eyes, but I imagine it would be something along these lines. Now, if you will allow me to play optometrist, we'll try on a few corrective lenses throughout the length of this video to see if we can clear things up for you a bit. But for now, lest anyone think I'm focusing too much on your analogy, let's discuss ideologies. Now, I would define ideology, um, well, I, I would tweak Google's definition to be a system of ideas and ideals, especially one that forms the basis of religious, philosophical, or political theory. A theory, of course, is a supposition or system of ideas intended to explain something. In other words, they are interpretive models of reality. Models which help us to make sense of our sensory data. Everything we see, hear, taste, smell, feel, we have to find some way to make sense of it. So what we do is we, we filter it through layers of abstraction in order to categorize it and, and be able to use those abstractions to both make sense of it and also to be able to uh, discuss it and, and, and talk about it, right? These abstractions are absolutely necessary for, for communication. Without abstraction, all you have is literally the light in your eyes, what the light is bringing to your eyes. And honestly, there's no way to put, put the sensory data into words without already abstracting them to some degree. For example, you may remember this photograph. You applied various uh, lenses to, to interpret the data that was here in ways that uh, various ideological lenses might interpret them. But let's, let's take you at your word that we want to strip all lenses away and just see only what is objectively there. Well, I cannot tell that this man is a police officer, right? That is an interpretation. It's an interpretation based off of the emblems he wears and the insignia, right? Based off of the colors and shapes which I take to be a uniform. I cannot tell that this man is a man because that relies on the fact that I'm putting together a collection of shapes and colors which I recognize as arms, eyes, nose, mouth, ears, and I collect all of that and interpret that to be human, and then I collect the uh, gender signifiers, I guess, if you want to go with uh, those terms, to, to classify him as a man. The same is true as the of the woman, and of everything else in this, in this picture of this photograph, right? Even the colors and shapes are abstractions of what I'm actually seeing. What I'm actually seeing, I cannot put into words. You have to see it for yourself. But I suppose if you were to twist my arm and make me put what I'm seeing into some words, but words which uh, did not allow for me to make any interpretation above and beyond what I'm actually experiencing, this is what you would get. I mean, thing in and of itself is an abstract category as well, but it's the best we're going to get by. Now that we've established the baseline of, of going to one extreme, of not interpreting at all, let's look at what happens when you fail to interpret something that is in front of you correctly. Um, and this is something I think that most people can see and, and agree with my interpretations on, which is why I'm going to put it forward as, as an example here. You mentioned in your video that we're not certain that this man is even putting the cuffs onto this woman, or if he is taking them off. I would say you're wrong. 
Why? By looking at their arms. You see, cops tend to be a little bit more at ease when they're taking you out of handcuffs than when they are putting you into handcuffs. And you will notice his left arm is positioned so that he has complete control over both her arms, including the one that is already free. If she were to try any funny business, he would immediately lift, lift his left arm, taking all leverage away from her arms, and move forward uh, with, you know, with his full body weight to press her into the car that's in front of the both of them. That would take away any, any chance of hers to escape or to use any leverage in her legs. He has complete control over this situation. By that and the fact that I don't see keys in his hands, I interpret that he is actually arresting her, that he is putting the cuffs on her, not off. Now, nothing in what I just said is objective. It is, in fact, as you uh, said, it's, it's a speculation. As I said earlier, it's a speculation that this man is a cop. He could very well be a stripper, and this woman could very well be an off-duty or undercover cop. We do not know just by looking at this picture. But we can make reasonable interpretations based off of our previous experience in reality, in the, in the real world. Here we go. How are these lenses? Better? Okay. Back to abstractions and interpretation. Because I have these abstract categories, categories which may not be reflected in any specific item in reality, I am able to categorize every specific item in reality in such a way that I can then communicate them to other people and have them recognize what I'm talking about. When I see a red car, red car is not really what I'm seeing, right? I'm seeing some specific object in in my environment. But I'm able to categorize it and say this thing is like other things I have seen before in some way. This thing is a car and I can put it in that category and I can say well okay this thing is also red and I can put it in that abstract category right. I've never seen a red. I cannot lift a red. I have never been able to experience car in this platonic essence of, of things that we construct within our minds. Yet, creating those categories allows me to say red car, and you, sitting all the way across the world, not seeing what I'm seeing, can picture the exact same thing in your mind that I am referring to. Now, granted, uh, car is rather general, and I could, I could make it more specific, and I could cause you to, to create in your own mind a picture of exactly what I'm seeing based entirely off of abstract categories which I am certain you have constructed as well as I have. How's this one? Better? Okay, great, let's move on. We must remember that these abstract categories are in self interpretations of the data. They are not the data themselves. This is referred to in science as the problem of the experimenter's regress. The experimenter's regress refers to a, uh, a loop of dependence that exists between theory and evidence. In order to make sense of evidence and to judge its value, you have to have some sort of theory, some sort of theory-based expectations. But to judge the value of competing theories, we have to rely on evidence. The same is true of the uh, theories and the models of reality that we construct, these, these categories of, of abstractions uh, into which we may interpret data. Right? In order to make sense of what we are experiencing through our senses, we have to interpret that data. Our interpretations are based on theories, on, on models of reality that we have constructed based on our experiences of reality. Right? The theory is based on the experience, and the experience can only be defined through the theory. Um, over time, since we are model-making beings, we are able to account for more and more uh, discrepancies in, in between the two, and, and the models become more and more accurate to uh, reality. At least that is the hope. Here, try these. 
You see, our brains have to be extraordinarily efficient. And over time, what happens is we build models of reality upon other models of reality. We build interpretation upon interpretation, and we get layers and layers of abstraction. And it's fairly easy to tweak those when we are young and there's not much superstructure. But as we get older, it can become more and more difficult to tweak a low-level abstraction, a low-level interpretation that is no longer sufficient to account for all of the data we are, we are experiencing. It can be the easy and lazy thing to do to just toss out that data, to write it off as some fluke, as unimportant, as, uh, or even to, to explain it away uh, with an argument that should we ourselves examine, we would recognize as flimsy. It's easy to do this. That is the efficient way to go. And so it is the natural thing for your brain to want to do. However, this behavior ensures that your model of reality will never become more accurate than it is right now. Thus, if you want an accurate model of reality, you must be willing, when you receive sufficient evidence, to deconstruct whatever superstructure lies upon your foundations that have gone awry, and to build the whole thing up again from nothing. This does create inherent dangers to these interpretive models. There are inherent shortfalls, inherent problems, um, inherent weaknesses in our interpretive models, in the way we construct our reality, uh, our, our concepts of reality. Yet, without those concepts, we are powerless to make any sense of what is around us. Absolutely powerless to do so. So, yes, ideology is something that we should attempt to constantly tweak and, and make sure we are, are not excluding data that ought to be included. We ought to continuously be uh, turn an introspective eye on the theory we are using to interpret the facts but we cannot assume that we can that we can call our worldview objective and everybody else's ideological this is this is a trap i see you falling into uh, regularly in a sense it's kind of the reverse problem of the emperor's new clothes rather than believing that you have an invisible set of clothes which in reality you do not have you walk around believing you are free from any lenses, which in reality, you do have. You like to flatter yourself that your ideology is simply an objective model of reality, based entirely on the facts. Uh, but everybody in the world thinks the same of theirs. Right? And it, it's not a matter of whether or not you are looking at facts, or whether or not you are trying to start with facts. That's, that's not where the ideology ever comes in. Ideology is co comes in where you interpret the facts. And yes, you have to interpret the facts. There's, you cannot speak about them without interpreting them. You mentioned in your video some of the inherent risks of ideological thought as being willing to see your side, your team, your tribe, whatever you want to call it, as... Uh, well, that's the good guys, and everyone else is the bad guys. To instantly assume that because of other people's interpretations differing from your own, because they are bringing different uh, data into focus with their lens, that they are either ignorant or evil, right? And that they will then tend to castigate their, their political opponents. That they will then attempt to shut down conversation, shut down discourse by calling them racist, bigots, um, what have you. And yet when I heard you mention this, I couldn't help but think about your conversation not too long ago with Baring, 
Uh, you, you spoke for a few minutes about that guy T, and you mentioned that he has been making a lot of videos about anarcho-capitalism. And what you did right there is exactly what you castigated others for doing. You said, you kind of lamented the fact that that guy T has given himself so fully over to an ideology. And just like that, you immediately dismiss any validity to anything he might have to say. You immediately reduce any points he might have about government overreach, or, well, any points he might have, period, to, to just ideological thought, to something that can be brushed aside, something that doesn't have to be taken, taken seriously. Something, in short, that can be dismissed rather than refuted. There's no point in refuting ideologues, after all. But if we can stop and think about what makes him so ideological, right? His idea that government is both evil and unnecessary. Uh, well, what are the alternatives? I guess you could say that government is good and necessary. You can say it's good and unnecessary. You can say it's evil and necessary. You could say that government is amoral and necessary. Or you could say that government is amoral and unnecessary. Now, what is, what is ideological about that guy T's position that is not ideological about the others? It doesn't appear to be his methodology, right? He doesn't appear to be doing anything in his, his methods of, of obtaining data or in interpreting the data that is easily distinguishable from your own methodology. That being said, I find it dif difficult to distinguish between the way you use the word ideology and the way a medieval pope may have used the word heresy, or the way, for that matter, that your opponents use the words patriarchal, misogynistic, hateful, bigoted, racist, what have you. In all of those cases, we have a poison the well tactic. You are attempting to negatively categorize somebody's arguments instead of actually engaging with them. Now, I don't want this critique to come off more harsh than I intend it to be. Um, you do uh, address a lot of the ideologies that you label as such, right? And you spend a great deal of time learning and critiquing uh, progressivism and social justice and social justice warriors um, and, and uh, refuting their positions above and beyond just calling them ideological. Um, that's part of the reason why I, I brought up the, the example of that guy T is because this is an instance in which you were unwilling to extend that courtesy to one you saw as ideological. But even in the case of progressivism, uh, if you look at the basis of the, the, the go-to positions, the, the foundation of your disagreement with the progressives, what are they? They are ideological. If I ask you what is wrong with social justice warriors, you will tell me they are authoritarian, that they attack other people's rights, that they do not believe in freedom of speech. Well, I agree with you, and I also agree with you that those are bad things. However, those are ideological positions in and of themselves. How do you define rights? How do you define what is and is not a right, if not through an ideology? How do you know that freedom of speech is a good thing to have? Why is it preferable to the alternative, if not through an ideological worldview. In fact, why is authoritarianism bad? Like these, these assumptions, these values, these um, mental frameworks that through which you, you address progressivism, they are ideological. Ultimately, I would say that the best way to avoid the pitfalls you point out in your video is 
not to fool yourself into thinking you have done away with all lenses in your own uh, worldview. Not to fool yourself into thinking that you are not as ideological as your opponents. But to be, and sh be sure to expose yourself to as many different ideologies and worldviews as possible. To avoid the echo chamber so that your views are constantly being questioned by others. This makes it far easier for you to introspectively examine your own worldviews because you're being given the really good arguments by somebody else. Somebody who is more uh, ideologically motivated to give you the good arguments and to not pull any punches. I thought it fitting that you use the optometrist glasses in your video. Those of us who wear corrective lenses know that when you visit an opto optometrist, they don't walk out with the perfect lens for you. You must first sit down and through a process of trial and error, figure out which lens is better and which lens is worse. Which lenses bring the world into more focus and which lenses distort reality or leave it unfocused. This is the far better analogy than the colored lenses you used earlier. In this sense, having any lens, any lens at all, is not in many ways better than not. Because it gives you something to start with, something you can discuss, even if it is somewhat distorted. The hope is that over time, and through trial and error, and through exposing yourself to other lenses, you will be able to find the, the lenses which lead towards a more accurate picture of reality, to a more focused and detailed uh, model of reality, until ultimately you come to the lenses which make reality clear.